Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Rishi Swaroop. I am from Hyderabad, India. I am an anterior segment surgeon. Although I do a lot of phaco emulsification, I think manual small incision does have its place. And um, I'm also a cornea specialist. So I use this quite a bit in my practice. So I'll try and share some of my experiences and tips with you. Manual small incision cataract surgery, uh, which is in short called MSICS, is a very useful uh, technique of cataract surgery, uh, especially for the developing world. Uh, because of several reasons. One of the main factors being that it's a very low cost surgery. It doesn't need any fancy equipment. Uh, it needs simple instruments just like you would for an extra capsular cataract surgery. But the beauty of this surgery is that it just uses an intelligently constructed wound so that you get a self-sealing incision without the need for sutures. And uh, the outcomes are almost comparable to that uh, what you get with the phaco emulsification and in many times even better, especially in difficult cataracts. And one set of difficult cataracts that we all encounter in our clinic is patients having bad corneas. And bad corneas can mean many things. It can mean an opacity which precludes visualization of structures inside the eye. So if you can't see well, you're likely to make mistakes and have problems during steps of surgery. If you can't see the capsule or you can't see the nucleus, you can end up damaging structures that you don't want to damage. If the cornea has a weak endothelium, we all know that the endothelium does take a beating during cataract surgery. Even an uncomplicated simple cataract surgery kills a significant amount of endothelial cells. But we have enough reserve to overcome that uh, damage, uh, atrogenic damage from surgery. But if you already have a compromised endothelium, like in a Fuchs endothelial dystrophy or um, an elderly patient who's uh, probably had a viral keratitis or any other reason, such a patient might go into a decompensation or may have other problems as a consequence of um, cataract surgery. So we have to take extra care in these cases. And in my opinion, manual small incision uh, works better than phaco emulsification, especially if you have a hard cataract where you end, will end up using a lot of phaco emulsification energy. Manual small incision may be a lot more friendly to the endothelium. Irregular corneas like post graft eyes or again, scarred eyes, uh, it may be good. Uh, another set of irregular corneas are ectasias. Small incision may not be the ideal one for ectasias because it's already a compromised cornea. You don't want to make a big incision in a compromised stroma. And uh, uh, post keratoplasty is one major indication where in my practice, I use malus small incision and I'll be sharing a couple of videos to demonstrate that. So when you're thinking of a cataract surgery in a compromised cornea, there's no perfect answer that small incision is the way to go. In my hands, small incision works well, but if you are a prolific uh, phaco surgeon, uh, and the cataract is not so dense, uh, phaco emulsification might give you even a better result. And some people are so well versed with extra capsular that in their hands that may work better than anything else. So there's no strict rule. It really depends upon the surgeon comfort and skill and various other factors like the density of the cataract, how uh, small or big your pupil is and uh, your, how compliant your iris is going to be um, and various other factors like cost, etc will also have to be kept in mind. So uh, uh, the technique of manual small incision that I have been taught is the Blumenthal technique. And that's the technique that I am very comfortable with so that I'll be showing you uh, the Blumenthal technique of manual small incision cataract surgery. I use a modification of that technique. The original technique uses an anterior chamber maintainer, but uh, in my experience, uh, I've had a few dismissed detachments because of the anterior chamber maintainer, so I've stopped using it. And I use a modification of that technique without this, uh, the anterior chamber maintainer. And I'll show you that in a video. So this is a patient who's got an advanced pterygium with a scar and a cataract. One of the first steps is to create a phonic space. You can see this uh, advanced pterygium, it's coming into the visual axis. Normally we would do a conjunctival incision first, but in this case, 
because there's an advanced pterygium, we would uh, excise the pterygium like so. I like to take the epithelium off the graft first and then excise the subepithelial fibrovascular tissue. So that's been cleaned and we've cauterized the major bleeders. Now we are harvesting the graft from the superior bulba conjunctiva. I usually don't take the limbus, I just take the conjunctival graft. In this case, so we've got a little bit of tenons, but otherwise you like to take as thin a graft as possible. So fibrin glue being applied on the bed. And then you basically put your graft in place and either suture it or you can just stick it down. So basically you complete the entire pterygium surgery first and the conjunctival incision that you've made superiorly can then be used like your peritomy, which you would normally do for your scleral tunnel. So cauterize the big bleeders, re reflect the tenons, make your incision. In this case, we are a little closer to the limbus, about one millimeter behind. You can make it, we make out, it's a 50% depth. So how do you make it out uh, uh, that it's 50%? You'll start seeing a little bit of gray or blue, and then you make these back cuts. So it's 5.5 millimeters, five or 5.5 millimeters straight with two millimeters um, back cuts, and then grip the sclera behind with a tooth forceps and then use a crescent blade to uh, make your tunnel. It's important to make the blade flat on the sclera like so and keep the heel down when you're doing the dissections. Side ports, 90 degrees across. I like to make two side ports. I'm doing the capsular excess now. One could also do the capsular excess as the first step. It's a good idea to use trepan glue. Uh, in this case, because the visibility is so poor, I chose to do a can opener also because it's a very big cataract, but um, uh, one would ideally want to do a capsular excess whenever possible. And then after a hydro dissection, you basically try and prolapse the nucleus out of the capsular bag. In this case, I'm using a Sinsky hook. One could also use a cannula to prolapse it. It's important to take out 50% of the nucleus out of the pupil and the capsular bag. And once that is done, you can just depress the wound with a McPherson's forceps, giving counter pressure at six o'clock. And then you can, if the, sometimes the nucleus gets stuck in the wound, then you can use two instruments to just kind of rotate it out of the eye. And that's done. You can see it's a massive nucleus. And even though the scar is almost in the pupillary axis, we were able to do a fairly safe cataract surgery uh, using a bimanual now to remove the cortex. Now this pupil, when it comes down, is going to come to the edge of the scar. And I don't want that. I want the patient to be able to see from that clear area here. So after putting in the lens, what I'm going to do is I'm going to enlarge the pupil on this edge a little bit so that he'll have a window through which he can see. So the lens has gone in. And now you can see I'm using a vanus to just make these little sphincterotomies only on the nasal side, on the temporal side, so that there will be a window through which the patient can see. And actually this patient did pretty well. He got 20, 30 uh, vision and he was pretty happy and we didn't have to do anything for the scar. So once this is done, you basically oppose the superior bulbar conjunctiva also and close the eye. Uh, because um, it's a scarred cornea, sometimes the port may not hold on hydration and it may be necessary to put a suture, but in this case, we didn't have to put a suture and uh, it's done quite well. So the commonest thing that we encounter is an opacity. And traditionally we've been taught that corneal opacities are <coughs> Sorry, classified as nebula, macula, and leucoma, depending on the density of the opacity. But uh, it's not as simple as that. In addition to the density of the opacity, other things which have to be kept in mind is the size or extent of the opacity and also the location with respect to the center of the cornea or the pupillary or the visual axis. So this is the decision tree that I follow. If, it's, <coughs> if I'm just thinking of a small incision, of course, I do fecal emulsification also sometimes. But in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on small incision. 
So if it's an eccentric scar, one could just get away with a manual small incision cataract surgery alone because it's really not going to disturb your visualization and you should be able to complete the surgery quite easily. But if it's a scar that's coming into your uh, pupillary axis or is going to be disturbing your visualization during surgery, then you have to do, a, in addition to your routine steps of small incision, you also have to do some special steps. And I like to call that MSICS plus. And if it's a dense scar, which is right in the center, and it's really going to not allow the patient to see after surgery, and even uh, your surgery is going to be very, very uh, compromised, then you may have to do uh, keratoplasty along with the cataract surgery. You could combine it with uh, a small incision. You could combine it with a phaco emulsification. You could even do an open sky. And this is called a triple procedure. So when I'm saying MSICS plus, there are various maneuvers that you can do to improve your visualization during cataract surgery. And one of the simplest things to do is put viscoelastic on the cornea, especially if you have a very irregular surface, putting a dispersive viscoelastic like so, in this case, I've used HPMC, suddenly improves your visualization quite a bit. And then the, on your right, you can see a video of uh, uh, an endo eliminator being used. Endo eliminator is, I think, a fantastic tool which all of us should have in our clinic. It's not very expensive. Uh, the vitroretinal colleagues use it all the time for doing the VR surgeries, but you do get standalone endoluminators, which is basically a light source connected to a fiber optic cable. And that can be then uh, put either on the surface of the eye tangentially or obliquely, or it can also be put into the eye through a side port. And that significantly improves your visualization of structures inside the eye, be it the um, a decimus membrane or the iris or the pupil or the capsule or nuclear uh, material or cortical material. So if you have a, a capsular dehiscence, zonal dehiscence, vitreous, all of that can be seen very well when the view is not so great. So I would urge all of you to have an endoilluminator. It's like a magic wand. Uh, when you can't see, it will show you what you can't see. Uh, if your surface is unhealthy, the epithelium is unhealthy, or you have these kind of deposits, the video on the top shows Salzman nodular degeneration and some scarring. And the video below is a case of uh, gelatinous drop-like keratopathy. The patient has had a deep lamellar keratoplasty, but again, the surface has become unhealthy. So this patient is going for a cataract surgery, so we can easily debride the surface. And that can come sometimes uh, cause a significant improvement in your visualization. Of course, at the end of surgery, you will have to put a bandage contact lens or um, add some other procedure like an amniotic membrane graft to aid the epithelial healing. Um, but the more important thing when you're doing cataract surgery is that you do a safe cataract surgery without compromising the capsule. And to that end, if you need to take off the epithelium, so be it. The second important entity that we all encounter in our clinics is a compromised endothelium. Now this can, this can be a spectrum ranging from guttate changes, otherwise the cornea is clear, to advanced bullous keratopathy like you're seeing in this picture. And midway is just stromal edema without epithelial edema. So till the stage of stromal edema, you can actually have pretty good vision and uh, the cornea may not really compromise your visual outcome. But if you have stromal edema, it means that the endothelium is not really working. And such patients, sometimes it may be wise to primarily think of a keratoplasty or at least warn the patients that you will be needing a keratoplasty soon. So this is the algorithm that I follow. Uh, one could do a specular microscopy and look at the count, but I don't think that helps me uh, take a decision about whether I must primarily do a keratoplasty or just a cataract surgery. There are patients with very low endothelial counts, even as low as 500 who continue to have very clear corneas um, and uh, will not end up in a decompensation. But uh, the real um, thing that you have to see is clinical edema. So if you're actually having only guttate changes and no edema, then one could actually just go ahead with a careful manual small incision cataract surgery with explained prognosis, of course. But if you're seeing mild edema on the slit lamp, and how does one make out you will initially only see stromal edema before you see epithelial edema when you are, your endothelium uh, is weak. Uh, and if you're just seeing stromal edema, how do you make it out? The simplest way is to look at the slit of the stroma. 
normal corneas, the central stroma is thinner than the peripheral stroma. But if you've got stromal edema, the center can be equal to or even thicker than the peripheral cornea. And that can give you an indication that this cornea is swollen. So, and that <clears throat> once it crosses a certain degree of thickness, uh, my cutoff is 650 microns. It may be th a good idea to think of primarily endothelial keratoplasty along with the cataract surgery. Of course, once you have epithelial edema uh, and bullous changes, there's really not, nothing to think about. You would straight away go ahead and perform a triple procedure. Now in the second category of stromal edema without epithelial edema, or even the first category, one of the useful ways is to ask the patient for history of morning blurring of vision. <clears throat> Many of these patients, the first symptom they have is blurring of vision in the mornings after a full night's sleep, the stroma swells up because the eyelid is covering and preventing detergence of the stroma. And uh, if they are having this symptom, then it's very likely that this cornea is not really going to hold the trauma of cataract surgery. And it may be uh, a good idea to think of a triple procedure primarily. Uh, another entity where you come across an endothelial, a compromised endothelium or a, a, a precious endothelium is a post graft situation, especially a post penetrating keratoplasty. So we have to take certain precautions like uh, to protect the endothelium. Pr enter outside the graft, so make your entry into the anterior chamber outside the graft. It's not always possible, but when it's possible, you should do that. Use a soft shell technique which is basically a combination of a dispersive first and then a cohesive viscoelastic inside. So a shell of dispersive with a cohesive cushion inside. And uh, that gives you both uh, the functions of protecting the uh, structures of the anterior chamber and the endothelium, and also keeping the anterior chamber formed. Respect the endothelium, avoid touching it, keep uh, injecting repeated viscoelastic, uh, you have to choose your lens carefully. Avoid premium lenses like multifocals. Avoid acrylic, hydrophobic acrylic lenses, hydrophilic acrylic lenses, because if you're going to be doing an endothelial keratoplasty, you need to put in air, and this can cause calcification of the lens material. Uh, lens powers will also have to be selected with special considerations because these are uh, irregular corneas, and so you will have to look into uh, the keratometry for lens calculation. Sometimes you have to do a triple procedure in these cases and a good thing to do is a, an endothelial keratoplasty alone. Penetrating keratoplasty is now pretty much given up unless you also have a stromal pathology. So if you've got an isolated endothelial problem with a cataract, best would be to do an endothelial keratoplasty like either a DSEC or a DMEC. If you're going to be doing a DMEC, uh, manual small incision is probably not the ideal cataract surgery. You, you would want to do a, as small an incision as possible. So in such cases, it's probably a good idea to do uh, this, uh, uh, the, uh, a FACO along with the DMEC. Or if you're doing a DMEC, then you could make a separate incision for introducing the graft and then suture up the small incision uh, wound after the cataract surgery is done. So this is just a series of videos to show a case with a hard cataract who had a Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. So you can see uh, already the um, incision has been made. And um, uh, it's uh, the Blumenthal incision is a 5.5 millimeter straight cut with two back cuts like uh, are seen here. Uh, it's a 50% depth wound. The straight cut is about two millimeters behind the limbus, 1.5 to two millimeters. And then these are um, about 1.5 millimeters, the back cut, angulated back cuts. So it's something like a frown, like a sharp frown. Once you've done this, then you initiate your dissection with a spiral tunnel, and then you make an anti-chamber entry. I'll show you those steps later in a more detailed video. And in this case, the rexis has been done and the nucleus is being prolapsed here using a Sinsky hook and then using pressure, counter pressure under viscoelastic, you can express the nucleus quite easily. Any size of nucleus can be uh, removed through a Blumenthal incision in my experience. You just need to construct your wound properly and you don't need to bisect the nucleus. You don't need to bring the entire nucleus into the anterior chamber. 
It comes straight out of the bag. Only the superior pole is prolapsed into the anterior chamber and then out of the eye. And then, uh, of course, you can uh, use several techniques to remove the cortex. One could use a single port cannula with an anterior chamber maintainer. In this case, I'm using a bimanual irrigation aspiration from my phaco emulsification unit. You could also use a Simco. After you put in the lens and wash the viscoelastic, you in introduce the endothelial graft like so. In this case, we are using a intraocular forceps to drag the graft in. And then you just inflate the anterior chamber with balanced salt solution and put air in the anterior chamber to tamponade the graft against the stroma. So the important thing to remember here is that um, <clears throat> The IOL power has to be selected carefully depending on the procedure of endothelial keratoplasty. If you're doing a DMEC, you can choose an emetropic power. But if you're using a DSEC, then it would be better to go for a slightly myopic graft because the DSEC lenticule causes a slight hyperopic shift, about 1 to 1.5 diopters. And like I mentioned earlier, avoid using hydrophilic acrylic lenses because there is a risk of calcification and that can compromise your visual outcome. So having a pterygium is like a chicken versus egg situation. Uh, when you have a pterygium with a cataract, you don't know which one to do first or whether you should do it together. So the, my decision tree is like this. Uh, it depends upon the size and activity of the pterygium and how much it is distorting the cornea. If it is a small atrophic pterygium, which is not likely to progress and it's not in the pupillary axis, I will just go ahead with the routine cataract surgery um, and just implant the lens as usual. Uh, one of the useful tools is to look at the topography which will tell you if the pterygium is having any topographic effect and whether it's causing any distortion. And if the topography is pretty okay in the center, then just go ahead and do just a cataract surgery. If it is distorting the central cornea, it's always a good idea to remove the pterygium. Ideally, the pterygium should be removed first. And then after a gap of two to three months only, one must do the cataract surgery. So if it's an active fleshy pterygium like so, then there's really no choice. You have to take off this pterygium first, wait for the cornea to settle down, which takes up to three months, and only then go ahead and plan your cataract, sur uh, cataract surgery with lens. The reason one has to wait for three months is because the stroma keeps remodeling uh, up to three months. So if you, especially if you want to put a toric lens later, it's important to wait for the corneal astigmatism to stabilize. Yes, so the next uh, important situation is cataract surgery in the setting of keratoplasty. And um, what this could be after an endothelial graft or a, after a penetrating keratoplasty or a deep lamellar keratoplasty. All these situations, the endothelium is precious and one has to respect the endothelium. So once again, use the technique which works best in your hands. Anything which is going to cause minimal endothelium injury, considering the, your comfort level with the particular technique, the hardness of the cataract, and the working space in the anterior chamber. Again, for me, my go-to technique in many of these cases is small incision cataract surgery. So in this case, again, we've made the incision and we're just making the anterior chamber entry. The reason we had to do, normally I would wait for all the sutures to be out and the corneal astigmatism to stabilize before doing a cataract surgery. But this case, the cataract was intumescent and the anterior chamber was getting very shallow and the intraocular pressure was going up. So there was an urgency to do cataract surgery soon. And that's what we're doing in this case. So we've made the anterior chamber entry and the capsular excess, et cetera, has been done. And we're just going to now, and then you can see after that, the after decompressing the lens, the anterior chamber formed quite nicely. And we're using a Sinsky hook to again prolapse the nucleus out. I like to use the Sinsky hook in advanced cataracts. Uh, it's a lot more control in my hands and often I like to go through the main wound and with these gentle maneuvers I try to prolapse half the nucleus out or more than half and once that is done you can see nowhere the lens is touching the endothelium it's just sitting on the iris you give counter pressure at six o'clock like so <clears throat> and then put a McPherson into the wound depress the internal lip and pressure counter pressure and very gently the nucleus is out as you can see here. Uh, the lens, like I told you earlier also, uh, it can, the calculation can be challenging. Toric IOLs can be used, but they have to be used uh, with caution. Uh, you have to make sure that the astigmatism is largely regular, otherwise you can end up with an unhappy patient with a lot of photic phenomena. 
avoid multifocals and trifocals and extended depth of focus lenses in these patients, they will not be happy. And like again, avoid hydrophilic acrylic lenses. So this is just an example of a patient who had a toric IOL and seven diopter corneal astigmatism was neutralized very beautifully. I'm just going to show you one video before we conclude. So this was a patient who's had a deep lamellar keratoplasty and had a, um, quite an advanced cataract. So we chose to do a manual small incision cataract surgery. So you can see we've <clears throat> made a scleral tunnel. Uh, we're, we're making the scleral tunnel. We've done a Blumenthal incision, which is about one millimeter behind the limbus, a straight cut with back cuts. You can see the heel of the crescent blade is always sitting on the sclera. That's very important so that your um, scleral tunnel is always in the same plane as the globe. Otherwise, if your heel is up, you can have a premature entry. It's important that your sides of your tunnel, the pockets are created well. Otherwise, if you have a big nucleus, it will get stuck in the wound. So the side dissection is very, very important. In this case, we are doing a temporal incision because the patient had a lot of against the rule astigmatism. Side port has been created. Viscoelastic has been introduced into the anterior chamber. And we're creating a rexus now which is done with a needle. It's important to get a large rexus when you're doing a manual small incision cataract surgery, unlike your FACO where a five or a 5.5 millimeter rexus is good enough. Uh, especially if you have a big nucleus, you need a big rexus. Otherwise you're going to end up compromising your zonules. Uh, after you've created your other side port, then you can have your entry into the anterior chamber. I like to use a um, keratome directly. Uh, this is a 2.8 keratome. So you enter, once you enter, horizontalize your keratome parallel to the iris and cut on the down stroke. Don't cut while withdrawing the blade, ideally, so that your internal lip is parallel to the limbus. And make sure that your internal lip joins up the limbus on both sides. It's ideal to have a eight or an 8.5 millimeter internal lip. And through that, almost any size of nucleus will come out quite comfortable. Hydrodissection is important to free the nucleus. So you can rotate it a little bit. Sometimes you can even prolapse the nucleus out just with hydrodissection. That's called a hydroprolapse. In this case, again, I like to use a Sinsky hook. So I put viscoelastic and I'm rotating the nucleus out. You can see I've got a pole. And then again, going in through the main wound and prolapsing the rest of the pole out. And then pressure, counter pressure, like I showed you earlier. Sometimes a big nucleus can get stuck, especially if your dissection is suboptimal. But if you've got the nucleus stuck, then more often than not, it will come out. You just need to manipulate it a little bit. In this case, I'm using a Sinsky hook. Don't just pull, you have to rotate the nucleus out like the old style telephone. You have to dial it out and there you go. I'm sorry, the video is not very well centered, but it's actually out now. And once that is done, you can again, depress the, the, you see it's a massive dark nucleus. You can depress the wound again to remove the epinucleus and a lot of the cortical material. I like to use the bimanual irrigation aspiration, but if you don't have it, you could use a Simco also. You can just enlarge the side port a little bit. You could use a single port cannula mounted on a syringe and have an anterior chamber maintainer through the other side port. It's important to always keep your port up and because it's a bimanual bi kind of a system, the anterior chamber is better formed with lesser prolapse. If you're using a Simcoe through the main wound, the anterior chamber tends to collapse and you can end up damaging the capsule sometimes. In this case, we're introducing a three-piece lens <coughs> into the bag, which goes in quite comfortably like so. Just making sure that the lens is well in the bag. And once that is done, you just need to check your, uh, remove the viscoelastic. Again, using a bimanual for that. And then you basically hydrate your side ports, check the integrity of your main wound, dry it with a Mirosil sponge or a cotton tipped applicator, make sure there's no leak. And once that is done, <coughs> 
If you feel the need to put sutures, uh, you must, especially in a post keratoplasty situation, the uh, wounds can sometimes leak, so it may not be a bad idea to suture up these wounds, which is what I'm doing in this particular case, as you can see here. And after that, you basically just need to cauterize the conjunctiva and close it. One could also close the conjunctiva with sutures if you like. So you can see the cornea is pristine and it's not been touched at all. And I'm sure if I had done a phaco emulsification in this situation, I would have caused a lot more damage to this endothelium than this gentle manual small incision cataract surgery has done. And I've done so many of these and these patients do really well. It's my go-to technique when I'm doing a post-craft cataract surgery, especially if the cataract is hard. So to conclude, cataract surgery in corneal diseases pose many challenges IOL with respect to IOL calculation, selection, intraoperative visualization is a major problem. And because of that, you may have a propensity to complications. Using an endo eliminator, um, <clears throat> use of trepan blue, use of viscoelastics on the surface helps to improve your visualization, removing the epithelium, fibridement. All these maneuvers can help you with different steps of cataract surgery. Manual small incision cataract surgery provides a safe and cheap alternative to phaco emulsification in these compromised corneas and difficult eyes, both to improve your vis visualization and also to protect the endothelium. Thank you. How important is scleral thickness? Do you deal with thin sclera? If you are thinking of doing a manual small incision cataract surgery, it's important to have a normal sclera. If you have a patient with a thin sclera, post scleritis, etc., it's always better to avoid going through the sclera. Either a limbal wound or a clear corneal incision would be uh, best in such cases. So yes, don't do a manual small incision in these cases if it's uh, possible. What is the best OBD for a compromised cornea? Ideally, one could use a soft shell technique or you could use a visco-adaptive uh, kind of uh, OBD which will provide both formation of the anterior chamber space and protection of the endothelium and anterior chamber structures. So um, a combination of cohesive and dispersive or a viscoadaptive um, like a viscoat. <clears throat> when to use an endo eliminator? Endo eliminator is a, a fabulous instrument, like I said earlier. Uh, you don't need to use it when you can see well, but if you can't see well because of any reason, or because you're seeing, uh, because you have a decimus detachment or uh, posterior capsular dehiscence or vitreous, which is not clearly seen sometimes. In all these situations, an endo eliminator is useful, especially if you have poor visualization because of a corneal opacity. If you have a dense grade four cataract with a low specular count, what should we do? I think I told you my um, algorithm. If you have a low count and a dense cataract, this is a recipe for disaster. And if you're well versed with small incision or even if with a extra capsular cataract surgery, I think that may be a wiser alternative than phaco emulsification very often. I'm not saying that phaco emulsification cannot be done. It can be done and we can get wonderful outcomes also. So it really depends on your comfort level, the kind of machine that you have and um, how dense the cataract is, how bad your pupil is, how likely your um, um, to uh, use a lot of phaco energy during the surgery. If it's a combined cataract and glaucoma surgery, uh, so yes, so you can combine manual small incision with glaucoma surgery. In fact, it's very, very easy with manual small incision because you already have a large wound. Uh, so you can easily create your trabeculectomy along with that. Uh, and that's a triple procedure. And uh, it's pretty simple. Just like you would do with the phaco emulsification, you can do it with a small incision and it's um, pretty easy. So manual small incision in post LASIK and uh, C3R eyes, uh, which is cross-linked eyes, uh, I think it's probably not a great idea to do small incision in eyes which are thin, have a thin cornea. <coughs> um, if possible, uh, do a phaco emulsification because you want to create as small an incision as possible that to in, try to go into an area which doesn't have thinning. So if you have a peripheral ectasia like a pellucid, try to go in from an area which is relatively normal in thickness and preferably do a scleral tunnel rather than a clear corneal incision for your phaco emulsification. Can tilting the patient's head overcome corneal opacity? Yes, to some extent. Uh, tilting the eye or the patient's head can sometimes help you see a little better, uh, but only to 
a certain extent. And if it's too bad, then you have to make use of other maneuvers <coughs> to improve your visualization. Uh, penetrating keratoplasty with IOL, should we be doing in the same sitting or separate? I always like to do uh, my uh, uh, cataract surgery separate from penetrating keratoplasty, but sometimes it's necessary to do it together and, uh, and that's also okay. Uh, whether to use a cohesive or dispersive viscoelastic, if you're going to be uh, anyway removing the cornea, it doesn't really matter so much, but cohesive will keep your anterior chamber formed a little better. So if you have risk of um, shallow anterior chamber or um, capsule being weak, etc., so you could want to have a better, <coughs> uh, better formed anterior chamber by using a cohesive viscoelastic. If there is bullous keratopathy, how to proceed? I think if you, once you reach the stage of bullous keratopathy, doing just a cataract surgery is not going to help. You will have to combine it with some sort of an endothelial keratoplasty or a penetrating keratoplasty if you don't have the skill or the option to do an endothelial keratoplasty. What is the best technique for nucleus delivery in weak corneas? Uh, in my hands, the Blumenthal technique works really well. Um, something else may work well in your hands as well. Basic principle is any technique where which will minimize the chance of an anterior chamber uh, manipulation minimize chance of endothelial touch uh, is the best technique uh, i like the blumenthal technique because there is no question of in introducing a lot of instruments into the anterior chamber you're not bisecting the nucleus you're not putting a large vectus inside the eye most of the manipulations are done outside the eye so uh, the chance of the endothelium being touched by the nucleus is much less than this technique in my hands. And the whole nucleus doesn't come into the anterior chamber, only the superior pole prolapses out. And that directly comes out of the eye when you depress the wound. So that is better. Uh, I touched upon the role of specular microscopy. Uh, it does definitely helps you prognosticate, but it doesn't help me take my clinical decision of whether I want to combine it with a keratoplasty. So it's good to have and good to follow up. But uh, I think pachymetry is more useful than specular microscopy. How to view capsule and anterior chamber structure during surgery? I think endoeliminator is the best thing and the other maneuvers like removing the epithelium, putting viscoelastic, etc., like we discussed. MSICS versus phaco and bad corneas. I think I told you this. Uh, depends on what you are comfortable with, how bad the cataract is, how bad the pupil is, uh, how bad your visualization is. Depending on all of these, you have to take a calculated decision. How to prevent SMS detachment during small incision? Uh, use sharp instruments. And um, I like to avoid using the anterior chamber maintainer because sometimes it can slip out. Uh, and if it uh, slips out and you don't notice it, the fluid uh, from the anterior chamber maintainer can detach the SMS. People with compromised endothelium and guttate changes are the ones who have a lot more SMS detachment. So in these patients, you have to be a lot more careful and uh, keep an eye on the decimage. If you have any doubt, tamponade uh, with a large air bubble at the end of surgery. Management of postoperative astigmatism. Uh, one of the problems with small incision is it causes a lot more astigmatism than phacoemulsification. So one of the things you can do to uh, mitigate that is make your incision on the steep axis. But if you do end up with a lot of astigmatism, there are ways of tackling that. You could do uh, you could do limbal relaxing incision or astigmatic keratotomies. You could do, if you have access to an eczema, you could correct it using topographic guided uh, ablation. And of course, you could do a piggyback to a reclens if you have a lot of residual astigmatism and that can uh, correct a large amount of astigmatism with wonderful results. Which incision is better, frown or Blumenthal? I don't think the incision matters so much. Both would work really well. It, uh, as long as your incision is, the tunnel is big enough, it doesn't really matter. Uh, even a uh, Blumenthal technique is very similar to a frown. What is the soft shell technique? We discussed that. You have first a viscoelastic cushion which coats the anterior chamber structures and inside that you have a bolus of cohesive, um, so first a dispersive and then a cohesive viscoelastic bolus inside that. Thank you. So. There's a question, what will you do if you puncture or penetrate the cornea while doing keratoplasty? Uh, if you damage a puncture while suturing, uh, you will just suture it up. <laughs> That's all you need to do. You're anyway doing a keratoplasty, so it's okay.
um, you can suture up that area uh, a little better. You, it's okay to put a few extra sutures if you feel that um, it is leaking. Dr. Swarov, do you use liberal steroids in eyes with marrow small incision cataract surgery with epithelial debridement with superficial deposits which are removed during cataract surgery? So I think the question is, if you're removing the epithelium, is it okay to use steroids? Yes, it's okay. Uh, you of course have to give prophylactic antibiotics, but it's perfectly all right to um, uh, give steroids as well, but just keep a close watch. Maybe you don't want to give very frequent steroids, but it's okay to give them. What is the rationale um, against the use of hydrophilic IOL in compromised endothelium? Basically, the rationale is if you're going to be doing a endothelial keratoplasty, like a DSEC or a DMEC, you have to leave an air bubble in the anterior chamber for some period of time. And studies have shown that if you leave anterior chamber air, which is in contact with the hydrophilic acrylic material for a longer period, it causes calcification of the material. And that can cause, can, that can severely affect the visual uh, performance of the IOL. So um, if you're thinking that you might require an endothelial graft, better to put a hydrophobic material rather than a hydrophilic uh, acrylic material. What is the price of uh, endo illuminator and which company, I mean, source to buy? Uh, it really depends on which uh, geographical location you're in. In India, there are a lot of Indian companies which make the endo illuminator um, box with uh, to which a regular probe can be attached. And I think in Indian rupees, it costs about 15 to 20,000 rupees. Um, so it's not very expensive um, as much as uh, a premium lens will cost you. Why you name MSICS plus keratoplasty as triple procedure? We should be calling it double procedure. It's triple because cataract extraction plus lens plus keratoplasty. Even if you are combining a trabeculectomy, it's called a triple procedure. When the third procedure is the lens implantation. Regarding incision, there are several variants like frown, straight, and the one you have shown, which is the preferred one in terms of less post-operative astigmatism. I think frown or the Blumenthal will have lesser than straight. I think Koch had this wonderful postulate, uh, which he showed that the frown style of incision induces um, less astigmatism, but I'm not really sure if that has been proven clinically. Can we use a can opener capsulotomy if MSI, in MSICS if capsular X is difficult? Yes, I showed you one video in which I have done that as well. But just be careful that your, if you're using a can opener, sometimes your uh, rex, uh, the, uh, the um, capsulotomy frayed edges can communicate to the posterior capsule and that can cause problems. So just be careful in your maneuvers if you have, uh, if you don't have a true bag, which means you don't have a capsular excess. Some cases have astig high astigmatism, why? Um, so the more you go into the cornea, the higher will be your astigmatism. And of course, a larger incision will introduce, uh, induce a larger amount of astigmatism and the incision is certainly larger in a man who's small incision. In my own hands, I induce about 1.5 to 1.75 diopters of uh, astigmatism with my Blumenthal incision. And sometimes I use it to my advantage if I have a high astigmatism. So if you have a lot of astigmatism and the patient cannot afford a toric IOL, you can actually sometimes just do a small incision and that might help you. If the K1 and K2 is not clear due to astigmatism, sorry, what is the most appropriate size, sight, and shape of the incision? Uh, basically, you have to be in the sclera, one millimeter or 1.5 millimeter behind the limbus. And um, superior incision is preferable in my opinion because after the surgery, your incision is covered by the lid. And because it's a larger incision, it's always better that it's not exposed, but the disadvantage of that is it will also induce more astigmatism compared to a temporal location. So you have to take into account um, all the factors and take a decision. Uh, shape of incision, we have already discussed. If the K1 and K2 is not clear due to astigmatism, can we take the other eye values? Uh, not ideal, but yes, if you don't have an option, that's uh, something which can be done. If you're going to be removing the cornea with the keratoplasty, it doesn't really matter. You can also go with the standard keratometry of 44 diopters. Why do you make 
two side ports because I use a bimanual to do my irrigation aspiration. Otherwise you could, if you're just doing a Simco aspiration, you could do, uh, make one. How to do biometry in cases with corneal dystrophy, large pterygium and leukoma. So if you have a very irregular cornea, like we just discussed, you can go with the keratometry of the fellow eye. Otherwise uh, you can take the help of some advanced instrumentation, um, some uh, newer optical biometers, topographic instruments, OCT uh, assisted keratometry can also be taken. So various uh, things are uh, possible, uh, but it's sometimes just a guess and you may end up with a refractive surprise. Um, without anti-chamber maintainer, can we call this Blumenthal? It, yes, it's a modified Blumenthal. The Blumenthal technique is the incision. It's a Blumenthal incision. Your method of choice to control IOP in your case of intumescent cataract post keratoplasty. Most of the time, once the nucleus, the cataract is out, the IOP will come under control. Uh, but if it doesn't, then you need to look at the angles to see if they have synecae and then you'll have to manage it appropriately with medication or surgical treatment as is appropriate. Uh, initially, of course, you have to give a topical anti-glaucoma medication and also mannitol before the surgery. You calculate the corneal endothelial cell density before and after surgery. Yes, it's a good idea to look at the cell density um, to see how much damage your um, surgery has caused, especially if the endothelium has been weak. But like I told you earlier, it doesn't really decide what technique I'm going to use or what um, whether I'm going to do a triple procedure or just a cataract surgery, it may help me to decide on choosing a small incision over a phaco emulsification if I find the endothelium is not so great. What are your thoughts on a small incision done temporarily? It's perfectly fine. Uh, it works well, but I like to do it superiorly because I like the wound covered by the eyelid. Do you conduct hands-on courses for keratoplasty, phaco emulsification, or small incision. I don't routinely conduct hands-on, but if somebody is interested in coming for training, I'll be happy to help them and they can contact me directly. Uh, what do you, what you do if you notice the wound is too small? How do you enlarge this type of uh, wound? If your incision is small and the nucleus is not coming out, I would push the nucleus back into the anterior chamber, put a good amount of viscoelastic as a cushion, Enlarge the wound a little more using a keratome or an extension blade. Uh, go a little into the sclera on both sides and then try again. And again, if the nucleus gets stuck, sometimes just maneuvering it out using a second instrument like a Sinsky hook or even a cystitome uh, helps to just uh, engage the nucleus and then you dial it out. It's a good idea if you have a good assistant uh, who can help you with that as well because your hands would be busy giving pressure and counter pressure. What, uh, what is the preferred IOL, PMMA, foldable or three piece? Uh, really any lens could be used. Uh, the, if you're having a three piece hydrophobic material, uh, that would be ideal if you have an intact capsular excess that should only go into the bag. If you're not sure about your excess, if you have a can opener, then please uh, go ahead and use a PMMA also if you like. Um, it's not a good idea to put a foldable lens in the sulcus. Uh, you should ideally be putting these inside the bag. So if you can put it in the bag with surety, then use a foldable lens. Otherwise, go ahead and put a rigid lens. It's perfectly okay. Interest of the anterior chamber maintainer. Yes, uh, I used to be using it quite a bit. Uh, you could use it if you're comfortable. But in my hands, uh, I don't really find the need for it. I, I'm managing quite well in the technique that I'm doing. Do you do hydrodissection with can opener technique? Yes, but it has to be gentle. Don't do a vigorous hydrodissection. How to avoid piercing the sclera through the wound? Normally suturing afterwards or with diathermy. Um, don't you fear IOL miscalculation with pterygium? On the other hand, why wait to two to three months after removing the pterygium? Okay, so first question, how to avoid piercing the sclera through the wound? Uh, if you're not sure about the depth to the incision in two, three steps. Don't go uh, hard on your inc initial incision. Make a gentle stroke. Then see if you're seeing a, a, a bit of gray. If you're not, you can deepen that cut. And once you start seeing a little bit of gray, that means you're at about 50% thickness. And then you can make the rest of the incision at that depth. 
if you go too hard you may end up with a very deep wound and you could have a premature entry um uh, do you don't you fear i will miscalculation with pterygium yes and that's the reason i like to do the pterygium surgery first and then wait 2 to 3 months for the corneal shape to stabilize i have burnt my fingers by doing the cataract surgery earlier the corneal shape will keep changing for 2 to 3 months especially if you're thinking of putting a toric lens i would certainly wait 2 to 3 months because the iol induced cylinder cannot be corrected uh, at the corneal plane even a toric uh, even a contact lens will not correct it do you give uh, more details about can you give more details about wound construction so uh, i think i described that in detail uh, you want to make the bumenthal technique you make a straight cut with two back cuts and these back cuts are not at 90 degrees they are at about 110 degrees uh, the straight cut is about 5 or 5.5 mm it's a 1 to 1.5 mm behind the limbus and the back cuts are, are further 1.5 to 2 mm behind from the edge of your straight cut and you want to then use a, a crescent blade at 50% depth all around this straight cut till you extend about 1 mm into the cornea if um, and the side pockets should also be made well otherwise a large nucleus will not come out once you've done the dissection throughout the internal lip should be about 8 to 8.5 mm for a large nucleus then you go in with your sharp keratome lift your heel of your keratome so that you create a dimple enter into the anterior chamber as soon as you enter horizontalize your keratome and then cut on down stroke to extend your internal lip on both sides till you reach the limbus and that's how you make the wound construction in blumenthal technique of manual small incision what is the endothelial count uh, for taking decision of msics versus fico like i told you um, Um, a, a, a normal endothelial count we all know is about 2000 plus so if your endothelium is anywhere uh, 1000 or below um, i would certainly err towards a manual small incision rather than a fico between 1000 to 2000 you can decide depending upon the density of your cataract um, the pupil how it is how um, edematous your cornea is etc and how fluent you are in either of the techniques which out of the two procedures sics of echo is method of choice in post keratoplasty and why in my hands post keratoplasty i always choose um, small incision because it's most endothelium friendly in my hands um but it really depends on your comfort with the technique and how hard the cataract is etc how big your graft is sir when we combine fico or sics and pterygium what precautions to be taken extra in such combined surgery uh, nothing unusual uh, just make sure that if you are using fibrin glue it's fresh uh, don't use glue which is uh, a day or two old uh, because then you may be uh, because it's a um, you are entering inside the eye so you don't want to have a possibility of an infection we shouldn't be using um, we using glue anyway but i do know that some people do that and it's not a good idea if you're going to be combining it to the cataract surgery uh finish your pterygium surgery first be careful um um uh, that you don't uh, take too large a conjunctival graft that you will not be able to approximate your uh, conjunctiva at the wound if you think that that's likely to happen then take your graft from inferior side rather than from the superior side or or from the site of surgery when do you decide to put sutures to the sclera if your tunnel has gone too deep and you see choroid what would you do so you don't need to suture the sclera if the wound is holding you have to check the wound at the end of surgery if it is holding you can leave it as it is if you're it's a post graft scenario sometime or it's a young patient like who is likely to rub his eye then in such cases it's a good idea to uh, suture it up if your tunnel has gone too deep and you see choroid then what you can do is you don't have to panic if it's just a straight cut a very small cut you can continue the surgery as usual at a more superficial plane um after everything is over make sure you put a suture in the area where you gone deep and um, it really won't cause a problem if your uh, uh, 
a large area of choroid has been exposed then suture up that area and then go 90 degrees across if you're superior go temporarily create a new wound and proceed with surgery as though nothing happened it doesn't really matter i notice you're mostly using three piece lenses is there a reason with can opener isn't it safer to use a single piece uh, you can use a single piece uh, or a three piece uh, even with a can opener just to uh, make sure that the haptics are inside the bag um, when you put a contact lens uh, and you can use a three piece pmma lens as well when you put a contact lens with a pending travel graft weren't you worried that the contact lens can scrape away the graft in fact it's the opposite the graft will be secured by the contact lens edge it won't scrape it away it helps to keep the graft in place so if you try the lens you'll know what is the medical management of post op para central sms detachment and patient presenting after 15 days with sms folds if you're if you if it's a planar sms detachment uh, all you need to do is put a large bubble of anterior chamber and that can help if the dismiss has scrolled on itself and sometimes it may not unfold on its own in such a case if it's a very small area of uh, damaged dismiss you can wait and watch sometimes the adjoining endothelium migrates slides over and that can overcome the edema after some time if it's a large area then you may want to just go and manually unfold that scroll or sometimes you need to do a uh, endothelial graft like a dmec how to use endo illuminator it's very simple it's like a a small metallic probe with a light at its tip so you can keep it on the cornea put viscoelastic on the cornea and directly keep it on the cornea at an oblique direction you have to move it around if you have a good assistant it's very useful that the assistant can put it at a, a certain angle in which you start seeing structures uh, you, if you're not able to do that you can also take it in your non dominant hand and put it manually inside the eye like a second instrument right next to the structure that you want to see it's a very very useful thing can you please throw some light on soft shell technique like i said earlier first you put dispersive viscoelastic to fill and then in that coats all the structures in the anterior chamber including the endothelium and inside that you put a bolus of cohesive viscoelastic like helon or sodium hyaluronate what would be the criteria to manage pterygium and cataract in the same setting uh, i think we have discussed this extensively any algorithm for iol calculation um, try to get a keratometry if you are not getting from the same eye you can take from the fellow eye what the, do does it need learning curve can be done without observer i do faco myself with no observation uh, uh manual small incision cataract surgery does have a learning curve uh it's ideally um done with guidance in the initial few cases at least but if you have learned faco on your own uh, you should be able to learn this also uh, you can see some videos and don't do the whole surgery at one go you can start step wise initially you can try by making a larger excess than usual and then if you're planning to do a phaco emulsification try to first prolapse the nucleus out of the bag into the sulcus then you can push it back into the bag and continue with your phaco so do step by step um, and uh, you can start by creating a scleral tunnel uh, like you would do in a blumenthal but only do a phaco uh, 2.8 or 2.2 incision and do your phaco through that so you can practice your tunnel but not the entry and once you have perfected the tunnel then you can start making an anterior chamber entry and uh, complete the rest of the steps you could also just do the tunnel and go to the opposite side and do a phaco emulsification through the liberal route so you can do step by step and once you become comfortable you can go ahead and do the whole surgery if the pupil is not dilating what will be approach i like to use a kugelin hook to stretch the pupil unless it's floppy you could also just use a sphincterotomy uh, once you have entered the anterior chamber you can use a vanus or you can use a micro vanus through the side port and um, that will help to enlarge your pupil you can use uh, pupil dilating rings but they will interfere with the nucleus coming out so rings are not a good idea for small incision is it wise to do lens extraction with iol implantation with pk in elderly patient above 40 without cataract uh if you are doing a penetrating keratoplasty always it's better to not do the cataract surgery along with it because it can compromise the outcome of your graft 
and also it can um, damage uh, you can end up with a wrong lens calculation so ideally you can do the cataract surgery later don't be in a hurry to remove the uh, cataract in the primary sitting uh, but if you think that there are some practical considerations you can go ahead and do that because another thing that you will lose is accommodation and that can sometimes not be very good for the patient can we use PMMA hard lens? Of course you can. Do you do specular in all routine uh, FACO cases? No, I don't. Uh, only if I have some doubt about the endothelium, I do it. You can see the endothelium in most of the cases on a slit lamp by doing a specular reflection. If you don't know how to do that, just look it up. It's very easy to see the endothelium in high magnification on the uh, slit lamp. If the anterior chamber maintainer does causes endothelial touch, what can be done post-op? <laughs> you will just have to wait and see how it clears up. If the touch is very bad, sometimes um, it can cause some permanent damage. But usually the anterior chamber maintainer is very small. So uh, that should usually recover in some time, unless it's detached the Desmes membrane. MSICS in subluxated lens or zonular lysis, uh, yes, it can be done. Why not? You can do put a capsular tension ring just like you would in a phaco emulsification. Uh, just be careful about prolapsing the nucleus. Make sure you have a large rexis, otherwise you will stress the zonules further. So having a large rexis is important. For cataract patients with pterygium, do you harvest conjunctival graft from the inferior conjunctiva to save the superior conjunctiva? If you ever anticipate possible trabeculectomy. If you're anticipating a possible trabeculectomy, please don't do a superior um, incision at all. You should do a temporal SICS if you're doing a small incision. Otherwise, uh, do a phaco emulsification because if you do a superior one, then again, that's going to preclude your future trabeculectomy. And yes, uh, it's ideal to take a conjunctival graft from inferior side or temporal side. Do you manage microconia with coloboma brown cataracts? How, how do you manage? These are very, very challenging cases. And especially if your coloboma is inferior, um, it can be a big challenge. So again, in these cases, uh, so having small incision in your armamentarium really helps. And I often resort to that. And it may be a good idea to actually sit temporarily in these cases because the coloboma can then be used to your advantage. If it's inferior, sometimes it can cause some difficulty in maneuvers. Sitting temporarily uh, may actually help you use that holoboma uh, during your uh, maneuvers to prolapse the nucleus out of the pupil and deliver it out. How would giving a suture significantly help in reducing SIA in SICS? Uh, so suturing can be done uh, if you uh, are ending up with a lot of small incision, but then it's kind of uh, defeating the purpose of small incision, isn't it? You're trying to do a sutureless technique. Uh, in my hands, I get about 1.5 to 1.75 diopters, which is not too bad, you know? So unless uh, you, and if you have um, a lot of astigmatism pre-existing, then you can try to put your sight of your SICS on the steep axis to kind of counteract that, and that can work well. Please do a webinar on refractive cataract surgery, aiming emetropia, especially planning incisions and IOL in different case scenarios. Yes, I can certainly do that uh, if Obis wants me to. Sir, in combined FACO or SICS with pterygium, do you give topical steroids post epithelial debridement due to pterygium removal? Yes, as usual. It's not a problem. Mm, where could I found record of this lecture, please? I think you'll find it on the cyber site website by the end of today, uh, within 24 hours, they'll put it up. It is necessary to do keratoplasty and endothelial dystrophy after cataract surgery. It's not always necessary. Sometimes the endothelium can hold on, especially if you have a posterior polymorphous dystrophy. Sometimes they never require an endothelial keratoplasty. Uh, absolutely brilliant presentation. In MSICS, it is important to do a big enough CCC. What happens if it turns out small? What should we do? If your nucleus is not very big, you can get away with a small CCC. But if you have a big nucleus, you better have a big nucleus, uh, a big CCC. Otherwise, you will have a zonular problem. You will have to end up enlarging the rexus, um, which is not very difficult to do also. 
management for buttonhole if it's a small buttonhole you can change the plane complete your surgery and often you may not need to do anything else if it's a larger buttonhole move to another site and make a new incision do you always perform endothelial count we've done that can you please repeat iol calculation target power in dmac dsec with hypertrophic shift if it's dmac you don't need to do any uh, change in the lens power if you if it's a dsec it will cause a hyperopic shift so about uh, my, minus 1 to 1.5 is what i would do for dsec good day when do you remove sutures uh, after about uh, 2 to 4 weeks you can remove sutures anytime uh, have we put have we to put sutures uh, not necessary if your wound is holding it's not necessary how big is your rexis? Uh, my rexis in a small incision would typically be a, at least 6.5 to up to 8 millimeters depending on the nucleus size. ECC, is it no more used? Of course not. Uh, ECC is your last resort. If SICS will, uh, if you're not comfortable with SICS, please go ahead and do an ECC. It's perfectly okay. Post trabeculectomy, shallow AC with hazy cornea. Um, such eyes, SICS would probably be difficult because you have very little conjunctiva to work with. You would probably want to do a limbal wound, either a clear corneal phaco or a limbal ECC and IOL. How do you approach a patient with who needs trabeculectomy with a large pterygium, nasal, temporal, and cataract? What order would you do, and how do you preserve conjunctiva for trabeculectomy? Uh, so <laughs> you would do a temporal, I would then do a temporal phaco emulsification and uh, pterygium would be from the inferior bulbar conjunctiva or from the fellow eye. Uh, do you do MSICS under topical anesthesia? Yes, you can. In fact, Blumenthal used to do it under topical. You can do it under topical, but it's probably a good idea to infiltrate some um, anesthetic under the conjunctiva as well. So topical plus subconjunctival anesthesia is a good idea. But you don't need to give a peribulbar or a retrobulbar block. How do you size your capsule rexis with a hypermature black lens? I will size it at least 7 or 7.5 and if possible 8, as large as possible. The good news is in these very brown black cataracts, the rexis doesn't really run away to the periphery that much. And it's quite easy to do a large excess in these very hard cataracts. Big temporal incision with suture, is it medical legally, without suture, is it medical legally safe? Um, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but uh, a lot of people all over the world are doing temporal SICS. And um, I think it's an accepted technique now. As long as your conjunctiva is covering that area, um, it should be okay. But I personally don't like to keep uh, a temporal large wound. Um, I feel more comfortable with superior. In triple patients, do you prefer Dimox or IV Manitol in all patients? If I'm doing a triple procedure, uh, IV Manitol, especially if it's going to be a full thickness procedure like penetrating keratoplasty, IV Manitol is compulsory. What do you use for calculating IOL power and what formula goes? There's no one formula. Of course, the newer generation formulas are better, but more than the formula, it is getting the right correct ca calculation of your keratometry which matters in these cases, and of course, the axial length. And many of the newer bio biometers and the newer equipments like topographer, the Scheinfeld topographers can certainly help you. Reading from incision side before closing eye, mostly towards the right side of incision, why and how to reduce. So if you've gone through one of the perforating vessels, it can cause bleeding. Uh, or in, at the angle, if you have damaged the root of the iris. So uh, if you're having a lot of active bleeding, put a large bubble of air let it stand for some time and that will tamponade your bleed and also stop the bleeding. If there is, uh, and of course you can suture up the area which is bleeding and the suture itself will um, help to tamponade the bleed. If there is circumcillary congestion post, post op following a decimus detachment with decimus folds, does it indicate compromised cornea? And what is the treatment other than keratoplasty? So you have to look at the cause for um, the edema. If it's a decimus detachment, you have to treat the decimus detachment. Try to put a large bubble of air to tamponade it uh, or unscroll it. If that's not happening, then you, sometimes just waiting will help to cure that edema. If that also doesn't work, 
then you will have to do an endothelial keratoplasty, which is uh, also not too bad. The results are fabulous nowadays. How long the time after PK to do MSICS? Uh, ideally, one should wait till all the sutures are out and the corneal shape has stabilized. Uh, Dr. Swaroop, a naive question here. I am a last year of the resident from Indonesia. We are trained to do ECC and FACO. Do you think for the later actual cases in life after residency, will SICS be extremely important to be mastered? Thank you. I have uh, been several years into my practice now and I still do use SICS. It's a very, very good technique to have in your armamentarium, especially if you're having a problem uh, during cataract surgery, nothing will help you like SICS. Um, you, you must learn it. For UVIT complicated ca cases, FACO has been described as the surgery of choice. Your comments, any special indications where MSICS is preferred I don't think it's necessary. Uh, any technique, even ECC is perfectly okay. Rather than the te technique, it's the technique that causes minimum damage to the iris structure. So whatever works in your hand, whether it's SICS or FACO, uh, whichever can be done more safely, causing minimum damage to the pupil and the iris is what I would suggest. FACO is perfectly okay too. Uh, some people discourage foldable IOL because usually rexis is more. So after some time, IOL comes out. Your thoughts. If you don't have a rexis, it may be a good idea to avoid a foldable lens. But if you have an intact rexis and you put the lens well into the bag, it's not going to come out. Uh, what are your thoughts on doing an envelope capsulotomy technique as opposed to can opener? Uh, yes, that could also be done. Um, but again, any uh, capsulotomy which is not a CCC, there is a risk of extension. So you have to be careful, especially if you've got a large cataract. How do you approach a patient who needs a trabeculectomy with a large pterygium, nasal, temporal, and cataract? What order would you do? And how do you preserve conjunctiva for trabeculectomy? Take emulsification not available. So same, I think we've answered this question, so I'm not going to repeat it. Can a foldable lens be used in the bag after SICS if the excess is large and would not envelop the optic edge? Yes, it's not a problem. You may have PCO, but you can handle it later. How do you handle premature entry? I think we've discussed that. Uh, you can go to another site and complete the surgery and suture up this site. So can we have video recording of that surgery? Do you have any YouTube channel? Uh, I think they're going to share these videos on the cyber site. Otherwise, if you want any other videos, you can contact me directly. I'll be happy to help. Uh, great lecture. Thank you. Great videos. Thank you. What is the frequency of CME after surgery? Uh, it's just like any other cataract surgery. If you've not touched the iris too much, you won't have CME. If you've uh, done a lot of manipulation, damage the iris, you can have CME. Um, it will usually come at least uh, two to four weeks after surgery. So, if you're not getting optimal best corrected vision after surgery, look at the macula, you can do an OCT and see. Is there a risk of around leakage? How to prevent that? If your wound is not constructed, it will leak. If it's constructed well, it will not leak. What precautions can we do for IOL calculation if combined pterygium? I think we've done that. What is the ideal width of the internal lip wound? If it's a big nucleus, eight to 8.5 millimeters. Youngest age, you do SICS. Anybody who is not likely to rub the eye, you can do. Children, I would not recommend it because they would. it's a big wound and if they rub the eye, the wound can open up. Uh, how do you prefer the type of incision when K difference is high? When do you go temporal when 180 degrees is steep? Yes, wherever it is steep, make your incision there. Um, it will help to reduce the post-operative astigmatism. Would you please put photo for your endo elimination? Which light source do you use? Uh, I will try. I don't have a picture of it. I'm sorry. You can just try and look for it on Google. Uh, I use a uh, the endo eliminator, which is, which comes with my machine. My machine has a vitrectomy unit as well. So all vitrectomy machines have a light source, but you can use a standalone light source also. They are easily available, at least in India. Post-op medications in case of corneal thinning with corneal degeneration, uh, as usual, if your epithelium is not damaged, if you don't have active infiltration, if it's just 
and inactive thinning like in a pellucid just use your routine cataract medication excellent webinar and q a thank you uh, how do you manage floppy iris in msics so that's a good question it's always a challenge in every situation uh, it's a good idea to use a uh, high density viscoelastic and try to minimize fluctuations of the anterior chamber so you want to avoid using an anterior chamber maintainer use a high density viscoelastic to push the iris down gently uh, manipulate the nucleus out of the pupil you probably want to remove the entire nucleus into the anterior chamber in this scenario first and you can use a sheet glide to keep the iris back and um, to help with the delivery of the nucleus in these cases but uh, yes i have used it in um, cases with floppy iris and you can get away with it just be careful about iris prolapsing because you have a large wound if a large amount of iris comes out you can end up with a iridodialysis in large dmd what would you use sf6 or c3f8 mm, you don't need to use a gas which lasts for too long so even air is fine actually if you give a good amount of fill but uh, sf6 or c3f8 both can be used whichever lasts lesser time use that one uh, does using anterior chamber maintainer throughout the surgery will not give you sk in post op uh, so if the anterior chamber maintainer does, doesn't slip out it actually can be a very useful tool by it, per se it will not cause uh, endothelial damage especially if your flow is not directed against the endothelium direct the flow towards the iris but if it slips out and detaches the desmus then it can cause a problem thanks a lot for taking time and answering questions um how can each how can other eye biometry help if you are not getting a good keratometry in the side then you can take the other eye keratometry for the biometry um it's not ideal but it can be a good surrogate is argentinian flag sign happy <laughs> is it safe to continue sics uh, so if you get an argentinian flag sign just convert it to a can opener and proceed as you would but be a little careful it's not a problem how to talk tackle incision bleeding has been covered if combining cataract with pterygium even atrophic pterygium with significant astigmatism can plan toric iol yes you can if the um, corneal shape has been stable for some time so i would suggest that observe the topography over a few months and if it's remaining stable you can do um, you can proceed with the toric lens also okay i think we have come to the end of all the questions thank you everybody